Tonight, we're talking about the roadmap to college, what rising 11th graders should know to stand up above the competition. My name is Ann Dolan, and I will be your host tonight. For the last 25 years, my team of tutors, executive function coaches, and college consultants have been helping kids to do better in school and, in to, and to get into the colleges of their choice. And there's nobody to help us um, with the latter who I can think is better than Kristen Landis. So Kristen, welcome. So glad that you're here with us tonight. Thanks so much for having me, Anne. Um, let me tell you a little bit about Kristen's background. She's a college consultant with us here at Educational Connections. She has her Bachelor's of Science from the University of Richmond, and she has a law degree from Emory University in Atlanta. And prior to coming to Educational Connections, Kristen worked at the University of Virginia as an evaluator for more than a decade, actually for 11 years. And while she was at UVA, she evaluated over 10,000 applications for students, both in-state, out-of-state, and um, those international candidates. And along the way, um, Kristen, you've seen a lot of admission trends. Um, your time at UVA and now in the last year and a half, year working with students here at Educational Connections. What can you tell us a little bit about what you're seeing when it comes to college admission? Sure, absolutely. Thanks so much, Anne. I think the biggest trend that we've seen since the pandemic is just the actual rise in number of applications. Um, it's just been ex exponential since the pandemic, the number um, of people who are applying. They're applying to more schools and there are more people. So what does that mean? That equates to um, lower acceptance rates. You just have that many more people applying. Schools like um, uh, highly selective schools like Ivy Leagues, who used to have maybe a 10, 15% acceptance rate are now down in the 5%, 4% acceptance rates. Schools that were having maybe a 20, 25% acceptance rates are now down in the low teens. You're just seeing um, that much lower acceptance rates as a result. And you ask yourself, why? Why is this happening? Um, there's a number of reasons. One, uh, since the pandemic, schools have gotten very, very well versed at uh, marketing themselves and advertising themselves through the internet. Therefore, people don't feel they necess necessarily have to go visit a school in order to get a feeling for the school. The, the biggest reason I would say probably is that we are operating for most schools still in a test optional landscape. So that means that schools are giving you the option of whether you want to submit standardized testing, ACT or SAT, or not. And as a result, students are feeling um, more emboldened to be able to cast a wider net to apply to schools that they may not have applied to in the past. And then lastly, I would say that colleges are doing a, have made a real conscious effort to um, attract students from urban areas, first gen students. So you're seeing people apply who maybe have not applied before in the past. But I don't want people to be dis feel despair because lower acceptance rates does not necessarily equate to the quality of the education that a student will get. There are many, many schools out there and you're seeing those uh, really exponential lower acceptance rates in those schools that are on top of the tip of everyone's tongue. And we're gonna talk a little bit about more of that later on. So Kristen, let's take a look at that. Let's look at these statistics from University of Maryland, UVA, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. also Penn State, some very common schools that we see kids apply to. Absolutely. When I started at, um, I mean, you just see 56,000 at Maryland. We've got 50,000, over 50,000 at UVA. When I started at UVA in 2010, there were 24,000 applications and Penn State had um, 78,000 this past year. NYU tops the, the charts with over 105,000 applications this past year. And Virginia Tech, a very, very popular school in Virginia, um, saw uh, also a huge uptick with over um, 47,000 applications this past year. Wow, it's really amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's not necessarily true of all schools. Like these are no. large state flagship, flagship schools. So tell us a little bit about what other colleges are saying. Yeah, absolutely, Anna. And we alluded to that uh, before that schools, um, not all schools are seeing these huge, huge acceptance rates. And this is where it's really important, especially for these juniors out there who have time on their side to do a little bit of research to really think outside of the box. 
There are so many wonderful schools out there. And unfortunately, we hear the top, the same 20, 30 schools on the tips of everyone's tongue when there are so many options out there and they aren't necessarily seeing these huge, these huge acceptance rates. I mean, a school like um, Babson College in Massachusetts has one of the best entrepreneurial programs in the country. Um, for musical theater, the University of Cincinnati has one of the best programs in the country. Nursing, Ithaca College up in New York. So there are a lot of schools out there that may you may not hear every day, but have some of the best programs in the country. So people really need to do their research. Yes, I know you're always helping kids with that. And that's where our juniors come in now, our, our students that are rising juniors um, well, I guess there actually are juniors now in, in most school districts. <laughs> yeah. And it's so important that they really build a strategy. So it's so different than it was when, when you know, even 10 years ago or when we mm -hmm. applied to school, it wasn't that strategic. It was all about your grades and your test scores. You filled out your application and you were done. Right. But not so much so right now. Tell us a little bit about why strategy is so important. No, absolutely. And I think for a lot of people out there, they're probably already in the throes of a strategy and they may not even know it. And that's one of the things um, that we do really well is help uh, people understand what their students are already doing and help them uh, put, pa package for less, lack of a better word um, and really elevate the students. So when they apply to school, they're more attracted to the colleges. So let me just do a, a just a, a teeny little introduction to what college admissions offices are looking for in an applicant. Three components. One is going to be the program rigor. How hard is the classes that your student is taking at the school um, that they go to that their school offers? They're going to be compared against the students sitting next to them in their English class, in their science class, in their foreign language class. The second component is grades. You can never get around grades. It's always going to be important from here to the end of time. So grades is another component and standardized testing if the student decide, chooses to submit. And we'll talk about that later on tonight. And then the third thing is what we call the human insight. I call it the human insight component. And what that means, and really, which is really important and what we at EC do a tremendous, spend a lot of time with students on is, what is it about your student that is unique? What are they passionate about? What are they interested in? Because when I was at UVA and I was evaluating students, um, I would look at a student and say to myself, what will this student bring to my college environment, both in and out of the classroom? And the answer to that, is their narrative, you know, what they're passionate about, what makes them tick. And so um, we call it, we always say, let's, we help students craft their narrative. And so what that means is, how do they spend their time outside of the classroom? There are a couple, um, and also what kind of courses they take. There are a couple themes that you're look that college admissions offices are looking for. One of them would be intellectual curiosity, a love of learning. So, um, and we're going to give more examples as we go on in the evening, but I'll just give one now. Like, you know, that would be, is your student taking the hardest classes available to them? Are they taking classes, um, are, they, are they looking outside of the classroom to further their interest in things that they're interested in? That love of learning, that thirst for learning. Another theme would be drive, initiative, risk-taking. Are they, you know, putting themselves out there? really trying things, exploring, um, that's really important to see. Another thing would be perseverance, persistence, determination, you know, all these kind of character traits that we hear thrown around all the time. That's what you're also looking for, what colleges are looking for. And then another thing I would say is making a valuable contribution. And there are lots of ways to make a valuable contribution. And we're going to talk about some of those tonight. And lastly, a social consciousness, seeing that a student is looking outside of themselves and trying to give back in some way. Thank you, Kristen. You know, a, a lot of times kids come to us and they're not sure what their differentiator is. They don't, they kind of see themselves as an average kid and like they've kind of taken, you know, kind of average classes, maybe an AP class here or there, or they've, um, you know, done what they love to do. Maybe they've played soccer throughout their high school career but they haven't done much of anything else and they're not sure what they want to major in. Mm -hmm. How do you get to the bottom of that and find their uniqueness so that they can craft their narrative? Um, absolutely. We have a wonderful tool at EC that we use. Um, there are uh, two assessments that we use. One of them is kind of a, a takeoff. It's a personality, a takeoff from Myers-Briggs. 
And um, it's really fun to do with students because I have yet to find a student where after they've taken it, I've given them their kind of the the um, the substance of, of what personality type they are. They haven't they've always gone. Oh, yeah, that's that's me. Um, so it gives them some really uh, interesting insight into themselves. And along with that personality trait comes comes different careers, different areas of interest that we explore together. And then there's another uh, assessment that we also do. That's a, it's called an intelligence one. It's not actually how smart you are, but it tells you what type of learner you are. And with that comes uh, different careers that you may be interested in because of the type of learner and your natural kind of your natural um, abilities and your natural inclination. So that's what, those are two really important things that we do at EC to help students find different passions, different interests. You know, high school's all about exploration. I mean, I'm well in my 50s and I still don't necessarily know what I want to do. So um, it's I try to give students grace and help them find uh, different areas that they may be interested in and help them explore those. Can you share a story maybe about a student who wasn't quite sure and um, they kind of found their way as they went along through the process. Yeah, absolutely. I've got bun- of lots of them, but um, I'm working with one student right now. And so he took the personality assessment. Like he he really loved to fish. And so he didn't, he, he plays soccer, but he's, I'm like, okay, well, soccer's fantastic. But, you know, what else are you interested in? And he goes, well, I don't really know. But, you know, and we, we start talking and he loves to fish. And so we we talked about that a lot more. He's actually going to start up starting. There used to be a fishing club at his school, but it's inactive. He's now he and a buddy are going to now like reenact it. So that's really fun. And they're going to be the presidents. But um, I said, well, listen, you you obviously and he's also a Boy Scout and he also uh, he had just loves nature. And I said, you know, why don't you take these assessments? And so he did. And under the intelligence one, naturalist was his number one, which just really fit him. So um, he's going to take this summer. I said, listen, he's real. He just loved thing, all things animals and nature. And I said, hey, why don't you take an ecology class? His, his high school doesn't offer one, but we found one online that kind of fits in his schedule. And he's going to explore that area just to see if it's something that he's interested in. So that's one student. Um, and then I have other students, like another student just sticking with the love of animals theme, um, that they really love animals. So they are going to uh, work at an animal shelter, volunteer this summer at an animal shelter. And they're also, uh, we're, we're able to get a shadowing opportunity at a vet's office. And, they, um, and they're and they looking at possibly going to see some animal schools that have an animal science major over the summer. So this can go in lots of different ways, you know, music, engineering, all kinds of things. Um, But that's just, those are just two examples. I love that because I know, you know, sometimes kids kind of come to us not feeling so great about themselves and leave like, oh, I do have that uniqueness about me. Um, And then you just, you just mentioned summer. So I'd love to talk a little bit more about that. And and really using summer wisely is, is important, making it kind of like a summer of intention, not just mm-hmm. going about it blindly, but kids really need to have a plan over the summer, especially when you're a rising senior. So what can rising seniors do? Let's talk a little bit about all these options that they have um, to make it a good summer. Sure, absolutely. And we just talked about a, t- a couple of them. Job shadowing is is a wonderful uh, thing. If you're interested, uh, maybe your student may, thinks they may be interested in architecture, or they're interested in medicine, or um, even just in business. Having a family friend or a relative, or just reaching out to a, a local organization in your town to see if your student could could come in and job shadow is a wonderful opportunity for them to see what's going on and also to use that on your application as showing further interest in an area. We talked about an online course. I have many students this summer who are taking um, courses online. Some of them are actually doing ones in person at universities. I've got uh, one student who's doing, um, who's taking like a community college class, but online, there are so many options that universities offer. They're super inexpensive and you can take them at your own pace. And that allows further exploration, but also gives you um, that, that showing that additional interest in an area. 
Certification classes. I have a student this summer who's getting their EMT certification. Uh, they wanted to take it during the school year, didn't fit in their schedule. We were able to find one this summer because she thinks she wants to go into medicine. So she's getting her certification this summer. So that's a wonderful, um, a wonderful opportunity right there. And I can never say enough about volunteering in any aspect. It is super important for students to find something that they're interested in and and see find opportunities to volunteer. I'm constantly looking for volunteer opportunities in Northern Virginia and other places um, for my students in the different areas that they're interested in because it's really important to show that. And then of course a, so a job. I have I had a student last week and um, he said, okay, so you know you were talking about getting a job. What's your thoughts? And he's like, well, I'm gonna I guess I'm just gonna apply to Costco or Home Depot. And I'm like, well, why do you seem so sad about that? That's fantastic. Getting a job just shows, it just shows initiative. It shows responsibility. It shows the ability to collaborate with other people. I, don't be apologetic for that. It's fantastic. So getting a job, I know sometimes it's really hard for young people to find them, but that is a wonderful, um, a wonderful uh, way of showing um, all those different traits that we were talking about that college are looking, are looking for. I also want to say that I have a one student who both parents work and in the summer they take care of their siblings. That is super compelling. It doesn't, you don't necessarily have to have these, these huge internship opportunities. Those are fabulous. But having, you know, watching your siblings, there's nothing more important than that. And so I think that's also a really compelling thing for a college to see. Awesome, Krista. So along with making it a summer of intention, there are also things that kids can do over the summer when it comes to course selection, because even though they picked their courses, you know, many months ago, there's still time to make changes if they want to do that. What kinds of courses would you recommend? And what is the strategy around selection? Sure, absolutely. That's when we when we started the webinar, we talked about program rigor as being one of the big components um, that college admissions offices are looking for. And it really is. So you want to see that its students are challenging themselves um, taking the hardest classes that they can um, at their school that they that's you know within their range also you don't want to put a stop put set up a student for failure so there's there's a, there's a healthy balance with regards to that but you also want to see students taking courses in their area of interest so let's say hypothetically you are a um, you're a, you want to go into engineering so and in, in, you're definitely going to want to have physics you're going to have one of want to have one of your highest physics levels. You're going to want to have calculus, probably BC calculus, but you also want to see engineering classes, or maybe you're interested in um, business. So a lot of academy courses in Northern Virginia and other places, um, entrepreneurial classes, uh, marketing, sports marketing. So you want to see that those electives that you're picking are intentional, giving you the ability for exploration, but also elevating your narrative. And then in your core classes, making sure that the areas that you are interested in or you think you may be interested in, that you're taking those higher level rigor classes. I had a student literally right before we got on this webinar, she sent me an email and she said, I think I'm, I think I'm going to change my class. You know, what do you think of this? And so it's it really isn't too late to make changes. Um, I don't know if necessary guidance counselors will be so happy, but it really is super important. You also want to see an upwards trajectory in rigor. So if your student already started out of the gates in ninth grade, taking the highest level classes and APs will, you know, maintain. But if you started out in, in maybe a standard class, um, maybe it's time to push yourself into an honors class. Or um, if you're in an honors class, push yourself into the AP or maybe instead of one AP, two APs. Um, so you definitely want to see an upward trajectory. A lot of people think, well, senior year, you know, we can co senior year. Actually, senior year should be your hardest program of the four years in high school. Kristen, thanks. So we talked about narrative, we talked about um, grades and course selection. Let's move on and talk about testing. And as you mentioned earlier, it's changed a lot because many schools, not all, but many schools are test optional. Tell us a little bit about how testing can help an applicant. Sure, absolutely. You're right, Anne. I mean, at least uh, over 80% of colleges are still test optional. There are schools that have gone back to testing, and then there are also schools that have done away with testing altogether. The UC system will never see standardized testing again. Uh, the state schools in Florida, um, the University of Tennessee, 
those schools have uh, brought testing back. So we don't know what the landscape may look when the students who are now rising juniors, when they apply to school, but also testing is really important because remember we talked at the beginning of the webinar, one of the components was testing if you choose to submit. And testing is a way to differentiate yourself from the people sitting next to you um, because it is kind of a standard level playing field. It is a uh, indication um, that colleges can look at across the board. So testing is really important. We definitely recommend that everyone pursue it because you wanna have the option of whether you submit or not submit. And there is a strategy that we talk about at EC about when we submit to one school, maybe not submit to another. So that's something that we work through as well. So testing is important and you should pursue it. Let's talk a little bit about the changes specifically to the SAT. So the College Board produces the SAT, the PSAT, and all the AP exams, and they're really moving to a digital format. So you may have seen this in your school, um, parents, kids, in some schools, that kids had the option to take AP exams digitally. Only seven classes were offered digitally, but the big change is actually going to happen this fall. Um, students can take the PSAT at their school in its digital format. And then in the spring, um, kids can take the SAT. So it may not matter so much if you're a rising senior, um, but it, it may matter for students that are younger and that are moving in this direction. So I'll just touch quickly on um, the differences, especially if you have a younger student. So the differences are that um, still the 16 point, 100 point stick scale, it's still gonna be proctored at your school. Kids don't take it at home. Kids that had accommodations before can have them again. And it's the same type of subject matter. But what's different is that it's shorter. Instead of three hours, it's two hours. Those long reading passages are shortened um, and kids can have a calculator on all the sections. Um, it's also a more secure digital test. So there's less likely to be any improprieties. And it's offered more frequently, which I love, and you can get your scores quickly. So um, if you do have a student that is looking to consider a test, so maybe, um, you know, that you have a test score that wasn't really helpful. Um, it may have been an okay test score, I should say, in the spring of um, your junior year. But for kids that want to take it again, they can also take a mock test just to see where they are, or they can register for the um, actual exam. And these are our mock test dates coming up. And by the way, um, every school that takes the SAT or ACT, do, do not they do not have a preference. Um, they do not see one test better than another. It's not like one school has really cares how you submit and will favor one test over another. It really doesn't matter to them. Um, but what you do want to see is that when you do submit scores, that they fall in the higher range of their reported score range for incoming freshmen. And Kristen, I know you help a lot of kids um, when you're considering tests, what schools to apply to submit them to and which you don't. So let's talk a little bit about the recommendations in terms of what to do right now. Um, when it comes to their college list, Kristen, what is the most important thing? So I'm sure most people have heard about, well, you have to have a compile a balanced list. And so what does that actually mean? Um, so we're going to talk in a second about what a balanced list means. But this is a time, especially this summer, for juniors to really go explore and look at schools, both whether they do it at home, looking online, taking virtual tours, doing research, or they, if they have the opportunity to on their travels, if they're traveling at all this summer to stop by, I always recommend stop by a university. You may not want to necessarily go there or think you may want to go there. Walk around, go to the student union, get a little bit of idea of different college environments, big, small. Um, we're lucky in Northern Virginia, you've got a number of universities. You can just take a Saturday and go sign up for an informational session and go um, to the you know, University of Maryland or American or Catholic and see, get an idea of what schools have to offer because the more schools you see, um, you'll the more you'll know what you want and what you don't want in a college experience. So getting to a compiling a balanced list, this requires what we, one thing we talked about already is research, but um, you, you hear this that you want students to have 
what uh, what people call targets, which means that their GPA, and that would be the GPA at the end of their junior year that they would be looking at, that that would fall in where the percentage of students, the majority percentage of students in the middle um, go to that school. You want some reaches. Reaches are when, you know, your GPA um, and testing, if you decide to submit, is uh, is a little lower than the students that are accepted there. And I say to everyone, if a school has a uh, 10%, 12% acceptance rate or lower, it is a reach for everyone. College admissions is not an exact science. And then what some people call safeties, I like to call most likelies, um, and that is schools where your GPA and scores, if you choose to submit, would be um, a little higher than what the majority of students who are accepted to the school. So we like to, at EC, we make sure that students have a balanced list. We want schools that are not only what people call a match, which would be those schools that fit you both GPA and testing, but are a fit. We want students, that's really important to find a schools where your student feels comfortable. They're gonna be spending four years there. Um, it's gonna be a very transformative appear, um, experience for them. And we want them to be somewhere where they feel comfortable, where they have the amenities that they're looking for in a college experience. So the fit is, it's all about the fit we talk about. Um, it's important that you have schools that are both matches and fits for students. I know, Kristen, sometimes you get kids, and I've seen this a lot over the years, where they'll have a lot of reach schools on their list. And then they're, they're most likely schools. They're like, I don't really want to go there, or it's okay. Um, I don't know. I know that's not your strategy, that you'd no. rather see them put class schools on their list that they will absolutely love going to. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's kind of one of my own non-negotiables is that I try to not let a student apply to any school that they wouldn't go to. It's just it's a waste of their time, their their money for them to be applying to schools that they're not interested in, in that they would attend. So we really do a tremendous amount of research on the front end. And that's why these juniors have the luxury of time of, of starting with that research um, to really find schools that they'd be interested in. As I said earlier this evening, Think outside of the box. Think about what you're interested in, and um, and do the, do the research. One of the th we have a whole, I have a whole host of questions that I give to students to help them kind of ascertain what they're looking for in a college experience. And um, it's one of the things that I call is like, what is your ski slope? Um, and that is, you know, what is really important to you? For some students, it's making sure that I have a student who who wanted to go into animal science. I, I keep going back to this because it's kind of on the top of my mind. But um, she really wanted a school where they actually had animals on campus that they would work with. You know, sometimes they're just done theoretically. So she's ended up, she's going to NC State because they have a program where they have animals on site. That was really important to her to find that type of experience. I call it a ski slope because in my years consulting students, I've had a number of students who are interested, who love to ski. It's, you think it's an important hobby for them. You think, do you pick a college based on uh, the ability to have skiing available to you? Absolutely not. But if it's something that's important to you, it's something to consider. For other students, I had one student who was really interested in engineering and Hopkins has this, um, it's, they call it the um, Da Vinci, a certain type of machine that um, for research. And it just, he just thought that was the best thing ever. And that was super important to him. So when we were looking at schools, finding schools that had the type of research that he was looking for and the amenities that he wanted was super important. That was his ski slope. I love that, the ski slope. <laughs> yeah. So I know it's important for kids to ask, you know, what do I want in a college experience? Yeah, I mean, it is. And again, it for 16 and 17 year olds, it's hard to think about necessarily what you want in, in an experience. And that's why it's really important. We start, it's a conversation that we start now um, and we continue all the way through into the fall of their senior year talking about. And we, we, we talk about schools, we add schools, we subtract schools based when students get to, to go visit them or they do their research. It's really important to find that, that right fit for a student. About how many schools do most of your students apply to and what is the national average? So, I mean, I think the, the going recommended amount is somewhere between seven and 12. I think most people will tell you somewhere in that range. I can tell you I have students, um, we'll talk a little bit about early decision maybe in a second, but uh, we're, they've only applied to one school and it's worked and they've gotten in and that's great. And then I have a student 
who um, right now is just, she's got 15 schools and she's just pretty much committed to all of them. And I was like, you know, it's a lot, but if, if this is what you want to do, I'm with you. I'm going to support you through this. We're going to have a lot of essays to write, but that's okay. Um, so I don't want to say there's a hard and fast rule, but usually I would say for students somewhere between seven and 12 is kind of a healthy number. So when you think of that number, how do you group them into reach target and most likely? Is it um, more schools in the middle that yes. students apply to? Okay. Absolutely. And I would say that you want your, your biggest dose in those target, those target schools, and then you want some reaches and then you want some most likelies. And then there's also something called demonstrated interest. Mm -hmm. um, what, tell us why this is important to some schools and then not so much to other schools. Sure. And absolutely. And for students who are uh, who are rising juniors, this is a fantastic time to go out. And we actually have a list of all the schools that have um, that factor in demonstrated interest. It, it's actually what it says and what it means, demonstrated interest. They want you uh, schools if you are, you show that you're interested in the school. So you ask and they factor that into the their part of their decision. A lot, a, a huge factor, not necessarily, but um, definitely a factor. And so what? how does one show demonstrated interest? You go and you sign up for informational tours, you go and visit the school, you take virtual tours online, you sign up for their social media. Um, some schools have interviews. My students who are all about uh, to go rising seniors who are interested in William and Mary. William and Mary has an has an interview, an app, um, admissions interview that's optional, but it's a way to show demonstrated interest. They fill incredibly quickly. So I a couple months ago said, "Hey, the calendar is online. Get your get your interview for the summer." So my students who um, who are interested in William and Mary have have locked in an interview for the summer. Awesome. So in addition, um, essays and also supplemental essays are really important. Tell us a little bit about the difference between the Common App essay and then what schools also ask kids and then a little bit about weaving the theme into those. Sure, absolutely. Again, when we, we talked at the beginning of the evening, program rigor, grades, human the human insight component of which essays is, is a component of that and a big a big part because that is where the student is actually their unique voice and unique perspective which an admissions officer is trying to glean from the entire application this is the time for the student to actually have that so uh, right now we're in the throes of working with students um, with their essays their common app essays who are going to be rising seniors who try to get all those things done during the summer so they can enjoy their senior year. Um, so the, the Common App essay, it's between 400 and 650 words. And it is, um, there are seven prompts of which prompt number seven is write whatever you want. So I try to not have my students get too hung up on the prompts. And it really is the opportunity to talk about what's important to the student, what their unique voice and perspective. And it's not necessarily the topic that's so important. It's the journey that the student takes the uh, reader on um, and shows how whatever that topic is, what impact that has had on them and how that has shaped them going forward in their life and in other parts of their life. So um, we do a tremendous amount of brainstorming and uh, and working and I have a kind of a recommended essay structure that we talk about, but essays are very, very important. And then that's the common app essay. And then, Anne, you talked about the supplemental essays and those have become increasingly important for schools, especially when there are so many people applying because the supplemental uh, essays, they're shorter. Um, some schools have one, some have two, four, six, some of them, and then some schools don't have any, but most of them are starting, you're starting to see them because this is the opportunity for the student to show their interest in the school. Most of the essays are geared towards why my school? Why do you want to come to Clemson? Why do you want to come to Virginia Tech? And then the other questions are usually, um, some of them are playful, but they're, they're, they delve more deeply into what the student is interested in studying. And sometimes like uh, a little more playful and like, you know, what do you want to, well, if you had, um, you know, what's your favorite ice cream flavor or what do you do in your free time? So they kind of run the gamut, but they, they are becoming very important. Now we're seeing more and more kids diagnosed with ADHD and other learning challenges. And sometimes they'll say, 
should I divulge this to the school or should I talk about this in my essay? And their kids are unsure whether, you know, to, to put this forth. What are your feelings behind explaining a challenge? Absolutely. And it breaks my heart when a student um, says, you know, I, I, should I not be talking about this? Or I didn't. And I'm like, if you feel comfortable, and that's the first thing, if you've got to feel comfortable with this, if you feel comfortable talking about whatever the challenges that you have faced, um, by all means do, because that brings, that shows your authenticity, that shows who you are, it's shaped you as an individual. So I want to hear about it as a college, um, uh, a college um, evaluator, you know, whether you be grappling with, um, you know, OCD, or ADHD, or another significant learning disability, or maybe a student has us on the spectrum. I've had all those types of students. And um, I if they feel comfortable with it, which I first want to make sure that is first paramount, then it's something that we do deal with either in their Common App essay, or there's an additional information session, uh, section on the Common App, where we uh, talk about it there. And then let's shift a little bit, Kristen, to how and when. I know there's different ways kids can apply. Um, there's different time frames. Talk to us a little bit about going forth. Sure. And there's and this is going back to strategy. Excuse me, I just lost my earplug. Um, there's definitely a strategy to how and when to apply. So it's it's really child specific, student specific. Um, but one of the trends you are seeing is more and more students are applying early to school. Now that may ne- that's early decision and early action. So let's talk really briefly the, the difference between the two. Early decision is a binding contract between the student, the guidance counselor, the parent, and the school. You can apply to one school. And if you get into that school, you are bound to go to that school. The only reason you can, the only way you can get out of going to that school is if you do not receive the aid that you would need to be able to, financial aid, to be able to go to that school, and then you can get out of the contract. But that's early decision. They're mainly November 1st deadlines. Um, and you will see, and it depends on the school, and this is where research is so important, that uh, schools are uh, filling a lot of their class from early decision. A school like Duke fills half their class from early decision. Um, Dartmouth, 21% from early decision, whereas their regular decision is uh, 6%. Or um, Tufts is another school, 50%. You're seeing they're accepting early decision. So it just depends on the school. Some of them, um, Georgetown doesn't have early decision. Some schools, it's a huge factor and you can increase your chance of getting in that much more. Other schools, not so much. So that's early decision. Early action is being able to apply to a school early, but you're not bound by it. You can apply to as many schools as you want and you don't have to go to them, but you will find out earlier. It's usually a November 1st, November 15th deadline. For Virginia Tech, it's a December 1st deadline, but you find out like the end of January, um, beginning of February versus if you applied regular decision when most students find out the end of March, beginning of April. So there's a real strategy to when uh, when you apply and to which schools you apply to. If let's say hypothetically, your grades aren't necessarily what you wanted them to be by the end of your junior year, you may want those first semester grades of senior year um, if you do, if you can get your grades up and you would wanna apply regular decision because you want schools to see that upward trajectory and improvement in your grades. Kristen, to wrap up, I know that you believe there is definitely a college for everyone, despite all the hoopla we hear about so many applications. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that is pretty much our mantra. There really is a school for everyone. There are over 2000 schools in this country of all different types and kinds that offer all kinds of things. Um, This is an incredibly important decision for a student at this point in their life. However, it doesn't define how happy they're going to be in life. It doesn't necessarily define how successful they're going to be in life. Um, It really is about finding the right place for the student um, and setting them up for success. And that's our that's our primary goal at EC for that. Thank you, Kristen. We're going to go to the Q&A in just a second. So if you have a question, feel free to pop it into the chat. Um, And I want to let you know, we've made this easy for you. We broke this down by grade level. So whether you have a freshman, sophomore, junior or senior, these are the, some of the things, a little checklist of what you need to do at each grade level. And if this would be helpful to you, 
you can get it by um, going to our website, which is ectutoring.com. And then it's slash summer dash 23. And um, I think that's right. Is that right, Melissa? Put that in the chat. I just want to make sure. Um, but anyways, it's a fabulous college checklist and it will um, put you on the right path going forward. And we're happy to help you. You know, if we can help, whether you have a rising ninth or 10th grader, um, a rising junior or, or, or a senior, we now have them in our senior express program. We have a specific program for each grade level. And Erin Ebert is our director of college counseling and um, she partners with Jennifer Gonzalez. Erin's been with me for 13 years. And she's very adept at helping families um, with their college journey. And whether you want to work with Kristen or another one of our college consultants, or you just want some questions answered, we're happy to help you. You can hold up your phone and scan that QR code and it will go to their calendars. And um, before we get to q and I wanted to let you know we have a webinar coming up um, on the 14th um, really soon from one to two o'clock and it's on stopping the summer slide without sacrificing summer fun, if that's of interest to you. All right, so, um, oh, and I want to remind you after we finish with Q&A, a survey will pop up and if you will be so kind as to fill that out, it will help us plan future events. So let's take a look at the chat and see what people have on their minds. If you posted a question earlier that we may have already covered, I may skip that just because it was posted before we got into the content. Um, so Allison says, if my student didn't take the PSAT during 10th grade at all, should he take it in the fall of 11th grade to prep for the SAT in the spring of that year? And the answer is absolutely. You know, if whenever your child is offered a test, they should take it through their school. So even if your student didn't take it in the fall of 10th grade, absolutely take it in the fall of 11th. Statistically speaking, students score their best in the spring of their junior year. Um, and that is for three factors. They have more time under their belts, more curriculum. Um, they're older and they're more mature. And so um, even if students do take, a, a, you know, a real SAT or ACT in the fall, we encourage them that if they're not like super happy with their score to continue to prep and then take it again in the spring because that typically produces the best results. But everybody should be preparing for a test. You shouldn't just roll up and take a test unprepared. You want that score that you get to be the best score you submit. And so for that reason, um, it's really a good idea to prepare. We're happy to help you prepare. You can prepare online. There's lots of different ways, but students should show up knowing what the test is about and the best strategies for doing their best. Um, let's see, Janice says, um, uh, kids with her child has dyslexia, ADHD, and dysgraphia, and she's wondering how best to support them through this process. And Kristen, I know you can talk about this, um, but I will say just a loss of experience working with kids over many years that there is no time in a student's life in their in their academic career that their executive functions will be taxed more than in the college admissions process because it is so difficult. There are so many moving pieces. There are so many tasks to be accomplished um, coming from many different schools that unless you have somebody to help you that's really organized and can be your Sherpa through the process, it, it's just going to be inherently more difficult. So I would say, Janice um, and Kristen, I'll ask you the same question in a second. Realize that your child may, this may feel overwhelming and you may have to either step in and help or have somebody outside like a professional help your child through that process. Um, Kristen, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, absolutely. And I, I can't, um, I second that, I uh, can't emphasize it as much as you have. This is, there are a lot of moving parts at this point when you're talking about college admissions and getting someone in to help on um, executive functioning coach or a college consultant or both. I can't tell you how many times we have team, uh, we call our team, whoever the student is. So team Jack or team Sally or whoever it is, we work together as a team or executive functioning and college consultants together to make sure the student is being supported from all ends. I also will say to that parent, um, really do your research when you're looking at colleges. Every college is required by law to have a student disabilities office, but they're not all the same. 
Um, some have uh, just testing accommodations, extra time, or you know maybe no taking. Others go into really, really have amazing support programs available for students. So do your research because they they are not all the same, and some have just incredible um, support systems for students with learning disabilities. Kelly wants to know, Kristen, what is the timeline for starting this process? Um, now, for, for, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Tell us about that. <laughs> I mean, I say that jokingly, but truly in all honesty, um, there's really no time. Uh, the, it's never too early to start. Uh, uh, we have students that come to us in eighth grade, in ninth grade, but definitely for this, the people who are on the webinar whose students are going into junior year, um, really, really important for all those different aspects of the application that we talked about that colleges are looking at and setting up that um, that narrative and elevating your students' interests and what makes them so unique. I mean, every student has it. So it's just a matter of, of highlighting it and um, crafting the narrative and packaging it right for colleges. Great. Um, this question is about gap years. And I know you've had some interesting mm -hmm. situations, Kristen, where kids they may want to take a gap year, but they're not sure. And you've done yes. a little bit of both. Yes, absolutely. So my philosophy um, has always been let's explore all options because the way a student feels now on June 12th, they may feel di very uh, differently on March 30th when college uh, decisions are coming in and they're about to graduate from high school. So for I have a number of students where we're where we are, we're um, applying to four year colleges we're looking at community colleges or other alternative type of um, educational uh, institutions. And then we're also thinking about gap year. I had a student this past year. Um, she came to me last summer before her senior year, and she didn't even think she wanted to go to college. Uh, we applied to schools. We also looked at community colleges. She ended up getting into um, a, a, a number of schools and decided on one. She's decided to defer for a year, and I've helped her plan her gap year. Um, so it just it it just worked out really well for her. So I truly uh, recommend exploring all options. So when the time comes, graduation, you you can you don't have any option that's closed to you at that point in time. Thank you for that. Um, this question is from Gloria, and she wants to know how how evaluators compare kids to each other. You mentioned earlier, Kristen, that it's school. It's based on the school. So. Mm -hmm. You're not compared to, if you go to Elm Street School, you're not compared to Maple School. Right. Um, tell us a little bit about that. And then also the question is around homeschoolers and who are they compared to? Right. Um, so we'll deal with homeschoolers in a second. But um, you're right, Anne. It wouldn't be fair to um, compare a student that goes to St. Stephen, St. Agnes and the, and the different courses available to them there and the opportunities as the same as a student who goes to Yorktown and then uh, compare that student to a very, very small school down in Appalachia. It just isn't fair. Um, so you compare students to those in their same school. And um, when colleges um, get the information from a, from a student, the counselor sends what's called a secondary school report. It includes the school profile of the high school. And you can, you can contact your school um, for that school profile. They're, most of them are found online. You can see them on your school website. And it shows, uh, some of them show like the most uh, rigorous courses the, the school offers. Sometimes they'll show if your school ranks or the top 10%. Uh, the first decile. It'll show demographic information about your your school, the number of people on free and reduced lunch, that type of thing. So it gives the college, um, if they're not familiar with your high school, it gives you information about your high school. So when they make decisions, they can make it in some sort of context. Awesome. Thank you. And anything else on homeschoolers? Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot to mention homeschoolers. Yes. Homeschoolers. Um, I always found when I worked at UVA homeschool students fascinating because they always do really amazing things. Um, so I would say that homeschoolers are evaluated very differently because it, it wouldn't, as we said, it wouldn't be fair to evaluate them compared to students who are in more formalized um, institute, you know, uh, educational settings. So it's really you want to highlight what your student is doing. This is an area that where you really want to um, get them out, uh, exploring their interests. I know there are cooperatives out there sometimes for homeschools, uh, homeschooling students where they can do things together. 
Um, but they're really, uh, when I reviewed homes, homeschooled students, they're really uh, an entity unto themselves, but can be really, really interesting, fascinating applicants. Awesome. So this question is from Stephanie, and she said that her son is really, really into band and drumline, but it takes up a tremendous amount of time, even in the summer. And she's wondering, is that really enough to have like one big thing that you're passionate about? It doesn't have to be band and drumline, but there's a lot of kids out there like this that love one thing. What do you think? Absolutely. And I have to say that I would rather see a student um, in depth and really passionate and committed to one thing than to have a whole, like nine things. Absolutely. Um, colleges know how much time is involved um, for, for band, drumline, for if you're on a football team or if you are um, on a, a robotics is a tremendous amount of time. They know that and they want to see commitment. Um, uh, they would like to see leadership maybe in those areas. That's really, it, it's very, very compelling. You know, we talked about those different characteristics earlier in the evening. And so I would not worry that your child is um, only involved in drumline. What I would say though, for those students, like I, I had a football player we were just talking about earlier who takes up his whole summer. But I also, that community service, uh, social consciousness is really important. So he actually is going to do a used equipment drive on his football team this summer. Um, I provided with him kind of a guideline for how to do that to show that he is um, giving back to the community, thinking outside himself. So, so even if your child is is really they have that one thing and they can't they don't have time to get, to do things outside of it. Sometimes you can do some other things within that. So um, I would recommend that to your to your band student for sure. Joanne asks if you use a common app, can you, how can you just send SAT and ACT scores to one school and not another? Um, it's actually fairly straightforward, Joanne. You can pick the schools when you go into the site of where you want your test scores to send. And one thing I didn't mention is if you're a child, I was just talking to a student the other day who um, said, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do because I took the SAT the first time and I did great on reading. Um, but the next time I did great on math. And uh, what do I, you know, should I take it a third time? And I said, no, it's okay. Schools will super score it. And so most schools have software that cherry picks their best score and puts it together in one test score. And so that's the test score of school C. It's called super scoring. Mm -hmm. So um, that's important to know too, that these days kids aren't taking it as many times as they did before. Usually they'll take it twice, maybe three times, but we're not seeing that as much these days. Um, and so you can be strategic and only send the scores to the schools that you want to. So kind of like Kristen said, it's pretty strategic. You don't want to send them all to your reach schools, but you're probably going to send your decent test scores to all of your, um, the, the schools, you know, at the, the lower 25% of your list. And Melissa, thank you for putting those test dates. I would recommend taking a practice test. I posted these earlier. They allow kids to take them in the comfort of their own home. It's a live proctor on a Saturday morning. Um, usually we recommend kids take a practice SAT, a practice ACT. We put them into a concordance table and it will tell us the, the test that the student is naturally scoring better on. And about a third of kids score better on one test over another. But for two thirds of kids, it's honestly a toss up. And for those students, we'll say, which one did you like the most? Did you feel most comfortable with? Um, the biggest difference is that the SAT is, um, it's, it, it's called a power test because you have to really think through the questions. What are they asking me to do? What do they mean by this? Um, so there are fewer questions. They require more thought. The ACT is at a faster clip. It's more straightforward. And sometimes kids will say, oh, my gosh, I understood what they were asking me. Those school, those questions are more like school. So it is kind of nice to see where I'm, where is my best score and only put your eggs in that basket. Only prepare for the SAT, only prepare for the ACT. Um, and that's really the way to go instead of splitting your focus. So um, Alan asked Kristen, do schools generally publish their early decision acceptance rates relative to their overall decision rate? Most schools do. I would not say, I'm not going to categorically say every school, but most schools do. Yes. 
Question about A or IP. How do schools view IP rather than AP? Or IB rather than IB. AP? Yeah. I mean, I um, in, in international baccalaureate is incredibly rigorous. So they they're they're on the same level as um, AP for sure. So really, really well would be the answer. <laughs> All right, good. Awesome. That's what those are my thoughts too. <laughs> yeah. um, Natalie says the early decision choice, can it be a stretch school or do you have to meet the requirements? That's a really good question. And um, hmm, that's interesting. I would say, and, and that's where a real conversation with the student and the family um, would need to happen because there is a philosophy of, you know, let me shoot for the stars for my early decision um, choice and apply to that school. And then the other hand is, you know, should I need to be somewhat in range and, and have a shot? So I would say I would err more on the fact that you want to apply to a school where you are at least somewhere in in the range versus a total, you know, shoot for the shoot for the moon. Um, Audrey asks, what do you what happens with a student who usually gets A's and B's, but one year they got a C plus? Did you address that in an essay or just leave it alone? No, I would definitely that, you know, if you've got A's and B's and then you've got this little outlier here, sometimes there's really an explanation for it. And so that additional information portion of the common app that I told you about earlier this evening is a wonderful area to address that. Maybe the, um, the teacher went out on maternity leave or you had a long term substitute or there are all kinds of reasons sometimes why a student uh, doesn't do well in a specific class, and yet all the other classes um, they've done well in. Or it, maybe it's just there was um, uh, the testing was the excuse me the uh, teacher was a really really hard grader. I would address it because I can tell you when I was looking at transcripts, if I saw that outlier, I'm going to be sitting there thinking, okay, what happened? So better to address it. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. That's really important information. Uh, from Sajal, you spoke about the difference in support services for kids with learning differences. Is there like a one-stop shop to find those resources rather than looking at every single school website? So, I mean, I, it's twofold. I would think, first of all, for your student to um, to research schools that, that fall within the, the, uh, the fit that they're looking for and then look at the disability services offered. But yet you also, there are a lot of resources out there where you can look at, you know, what schools are the best for dealing with ADHD or, um, you know, autism. And so there, it, I, would, I would handle both approaches, actually. Okay. Roxanne wants to know about the personality test that you talked about at the beginning. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's really fun. I love them. They're super fun. Um, it, they only take about 15 or 20 minutes. Um, the students enjoy them. There's no right or wrong answer. And it really gives some really interesting insight into them as individuals. And it, it sets us uh, it's it sparks a conversation that we can continue to have exploring um, their interests and natural talents. And um, it's fun. So uh, we have that at EC Tutoring, um, EC Connections, excuse me, that you can uh, can reach out to Aaron and we can set that up and do it. Awesome. Thanks, Kristen. And our last question, because we're just about out of time. Mm -hmm. um, is there an on, Karen wants to know, is there an online database to help develop a college list or do we have to buy the books? <laughs> You know, the internet is a wonderful thing. There's tons and tons of stuff out on the internet. There is that we have at EC, I have um, uh, search engines that I prefer that students use, but there's so much information out there um, that for your student to look at. A Naviance, a lot of schools have Naviance. Um, so I think that's a great place to start. They have some really wonderful uh, search engines that you can use. Yes. And another parent asked about the PSAT earlier. When you go onto the College Board's website, they also have their own internal um, search engine for colleges that help you compile a list too. All right, everybody. Well, thank you so much. It was such a pleasure to meet with you tonight. If I didn't get to your question, please send me an email, Anne, A-N-N, at EC Tutoring, and I will make sure to respond to you individually. Thank you for being here tonight, Kristen. Thank you, Thank you. as always for being my guest um, and for helping so many kids. I wish you all the, a great remainder of the school year. If you're still in school, a wonderful summer and um, all the best on working on those college applications. Have a great evening, everybody, and bye-bye.